Fellow Rotarians and guests, and thank you for joining us today for what will be our last program in our recent education series. And we are grateful and thrilled to be joined today by SDSU President Barry Dunn and University of South Dakota President Sheila Gestring. We thank them for their leadership and commitment as they lead the two largest universities in our state during this time of immense uncertainty. We will continue to revisit the important subject of education as we move forward, but we do plan to switch to some new and relevant topics beginning next week when we are joined by Governor Christy Nome for our first in-person meeting since March. Since the Rotary Club of Downtown Sioux Falls went into a virtual environment, we have been planning for our inevitable return to in-person meetings. We have spent a great deal of time reviewing safety protocol and talking with experts so we could return to an in-person environment as soon as possible, managing the risks we can have a reasonable level of control over. We are very confident that the protocol we have in place will provide an environment that our members and guests can be proud of. It is our intent to be meeting in person moving forward, but we will, however, continue to offer our members and guests the ability to participate through our live streaming options. Before I turn it over to Rotarian Tony Knorr, I'd like to begin with Rotary's four-way test. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? I will now turn it over to Tony Knorr, who will moderate today's discussion with Presidents Sheila Gestring and Barry Dunn. Thank you. Thank you, President Jason Herbolt. Uh, I am Rotarian Tony Knorr, and I would like to begin by welcoming back our Rotarians and guests for another virtual edition of Downtown Rotary. Uh, as you are likely aware, we've been streaming um, virtually since April, and all of our archive programs are out on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, today, we are once again uh, fortunate enough to be streaming from uh, Thinker Studio at 8th and Railroad in downtown Sioux Falls. Uh, for Rotarians joining us, you can submit your questions via Facebook, and we will do our best to get to them. Uh, we are fortunate to have very uh, two very distinguished uh, uh, guests with us this afternoon representing our flagship university, University of South Dakota, uh, President Sheila Gestring, and our uh, first landmark university, our land-grant university, uh, President uh, Barry Dunn of South Dakota State University. Uh, president Sheila Gestring is the 18th president of the University of South Dakota, um, and she took that role um, or was named president in June of 2018 um, after serving uh, as chief financial officer since 2010. Uh, she's not only a South Dakota native, she's also a two-time graduate of the University of South Dakota, and uh, she is also the, the second woman and the second USD graduate to serve in the role as president of the uh, University of South Dakota. So very pleased to have her, also pleased to have uh, President Barry Dunn, who was named the 20th president of uh, South Dakota State University in um, April of 2016. He has a rich academic uh, background, including bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate degree from South Dakota State University. Uh, also was, is or was a rancher, farm operator, uh, published author, and researcher. So great to have both of you here today. Uh, before we get into the challenges and opportunities facing uh, <coughs> your two universities, uh, let's start by talking about your professional journey. Let's start with you, uh, President uh, Gestring. Uh, how do you believe your background and experience made you the right person uh, to lead USD forward? Sure. So it's an interesting question that I get asked by students an awful lot. So how did, what path did you take to become the president of the University of South Dakota? And I've told many of them. When I was your age, this is not where I expected to be. Um, I started thinking that I was going to go work in a CPA firm, be a partner, maybe own my own firm. And I ended up in a car accident. I was fine, my car was not. And so I suddenly had a car payment and needed to take the first job available to me. Um, I ended up in state government, loved it. Uh, really enjoyed the public policy piece of it and the financing and how that is integral to operational decisions. So 
many roles in state government over the years, eventually landed over at the Board of Regents and in higher education, and I haven't left since. Um, just the mission in higher education is incredible to be able to change the trajectory of someone's life so in such a meaningful way is a very rewarding experience. And, you know, over the eight years when I was CFO, I had a wonderful mentor in Jim Abbott. And so I think that mentorship, along with just absolute passion for seeing what happens um, to those students between the day they start and the day they graduate, is hopefully what makes me um, a good fit for the university. It certainly feels like a perfect fit for my career, so. Yeah, well, thank you. And thanks for bringing up mentorship. You talked about President Abbott and uh, the legacy that he, he leaves. Um, mentoring is a, a, a big component of what Rotary uh, does with the community of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, and, and really being, building a legacy of people. So yeah. thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Uh, President Dunn, um, share with us uh, your professional journey, sure. um, putting in the role that you are today. Yeah, well, thank you, um, Tony, and thank you, Rotarians, for inviting us today. As uh, we work together, Sheila and I work together very closely, and it's great to be with you today. Uh, I've had a little, I've got a few years on Sheila, so it's a little longer journey, but um, after graduation from SDSU and a master's degree in animal science, basically went home and, and uh, ran my family's relatively large cattle ranch on the Rosebud Indian Reservation for about 20 years. Um, sadly, my parents both passed away at the same time and it triggered the sale of a ran our family ranch and I needed to reinvent myself. So I went back to school uh, relatively late in life and got a PhD and was on the faculty of SDSU. Went to Texas A&M system and taught there for um, six and a half years came back as the Dean of Agriculture. I love teaching. It was a, the best, the most rewarding thing I've ever done is to teach in a classroom. Did a lot of research also, but uh, came back to be Dean of Agriculture and then six years later became president. So uh, as Sheila said, I didn't set out in this to, to become <laughs> a president of a university, but I love higher education, just like Sheila said. So it's just, it's a wonderful opportunity. Very humbled to be the president of my alma mater. Yeah. Great, you can sense the passion in both of you. Um, and let's, let's continue along that line in terms of passion. And, and uh, for our Rotarians, many of them are familiar, might be alum of either one of, uh, uh, of your schools. Um, a lot of them are familiar with, with them, but for those that are not, or for those of us that maybe haven't stepped on your campuses for, for some time, talk to us about uh, what makes, um, let's start with SDSU, what makes SDSU special? and what separates you from the other universities that we have uh, in the area? Sure. Well, um, SDSU started uh, st as a state college in, in 1881, but uh, in, with, with, the, with the enabling act of statehood, was granted land grant status in 1889. And so we serve, uh, since then, of course, then we've served a major role in South Dakota's number one industry, which is agriculture. And, uh, but also engineering, pharmacy, education, you know, those, those uh, fundamental uh, uh, building blocks of every community in teaching and agriculture, uh, but also engineering. And uh, so um, just very, very proud of that foundational uh, uh, piece that is almost, that is every land grant university in the nation. Um, it, you know, also very excited about, um, you know, where we're, we're going. We've, we, we have uh, basically three PhDs in computational science, which in with data science, statistics, and and computer science, um, we have uh, we have a new veterinary science program with uh, the University of Minnesota. So, really rich history, a fundamental part of our state in terms of agriculture and engineering and and uh, uh, nursing, pharmacy, but also uh, now moving into new fields that, that are certainly relevant as Sioux Falls expands into mm -hmm. areas like data science and computational science. So exciting, uh, an exciting future built on a strong foundation. Yeah, well said, well said. President Gestring. So I think the most obvious are probably, we are the state's only law school, we are the state's only medical school, um, and we also have a very well-known Beacom School of Business. Um, I think less obvious, but certainly what sets us apart and makes us special is our foundation in the liberal arts. And that is true for every school um, 
even if it is one of the professional schools, that core education is grounded in the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And what I tell students when they ask me, well, what does that mean? Liberal arts teaches you to solve problems, to think independently, to communicate. Um, and it really prepares you to innovate into the future, right? Technology comes and goes, but the ability to lead, learn, and innovate never changes. That's critical. And I think that's probably what the Liberal Arts Foundation at the University of South Dakota, that's what sets us apart from perhaps some of the others in the area. Yeah. So. Great, and you, you talk programming, let's talk facilities. Yes. Um, for those of us that uh, maybe haven't been on campus recently, um, talk about some of the in investments, enhancements that, uh, that, that schools are undergoing right, right now. Let's start with, uh, with the University of South Dakota. Sure, so obviously the Dakota Dome renovation has been a big one. A lot of people were hoping to see that in the fall, now we're hoping to unveil it in the spring. Um, that was a $26.5 million project and increased the seating um, on the west side for those that aren't familiar with the project. That's all now permanent seating. And we also put suites at about a 10 foot elevation, which is very unique for this region. You oftentimes think about suites being at the very top. Mm -hmm. Well, in, an, in a dome, in an enclosed dome, we thought it might be interesting to try it at the 10 foot level and leave them open air because it's always sunny and 72 in the dome. And those loges and suites, I know you know, are just incredible. There's not a bad view in the Dakota Dome. There was never a bad seat before, but there's, they're even better on the west side now. So that's one major project. The National Music Museum is another major renovation and expansion project. We added 16,000 square feet. Um, one of the absolute gems in the state of South Dakota, uh, one of the most unique collections of musical instruments in the world. Um, and we are now in the process of putting up casework so that we can make this museum more broadly known and appeal to a more broad audience. We've always had a, neat, a niche following, mm -hmm. um, but we want, we want more people to have the opportunity to view what, what kind of gem that project is. Uh, another one in the in process is the School of Health Sciences. Um, thanks to the governor and the legislature for their support and a donor for matching that gift and the Board of Regents for um, allocating some funds for us to be able to construct a new, a, a new building for our fastest growing school on campus. Um, for anyone familiar with the University of South Dakota campus, Julian Hall was not ideal for teaching our students. Um, so we're very excited about that. We'll attach it to the medical school, which is in keeping with the direction of healthcare these days, where it's very much interprofessional. And mm -hmm. each of the professionals within areas, physical therapy, nursing, doctors, they need to work together as teams and connecting those two buildings will facilitate that quite well. So yeah. great. Thank you for the updates and, uh, President Dunn, you haven't been standing still uh, in Brookings. <laughs> Share with us uh, what, what's happening on campus. Right, well, we're excited to have the fall that I, uh, I became president. We moved into the beautiful Dana J. Dyke House um, Stadium, which has been a, a, just a, a wonderful um, addition to campus. And uh, the, but on top of that, uh, we, we put a f over $50 million addition into our Performing Arts Center. We have a beautiful theater, uh, just a uh, dance theater, just, the, uh, just an incredible facility. Uh, we did that in concert with the uh, city of Brookings, but also um, had, had a, a major donor. Uh, um, just a, a hope, hope people will come to see this uh, beautiful place. Um, also uh, built a... Uh, uh, with $62 million of state money, built a, um, a animal, new animal disease and research diagnostic lab. And uh, with that facility, which, which has a biosafety level three, um, we're doing, we're doing 600,000 tests a day or a year uh, on various animal diseases, but now uh, soon we'll be testing for COVID-19. So uh, just an incredible um, facility to support Again, South Dakota's number one industry. Also building a $55 million Raven Precision Ag building, which marries uh, agronomy and ag engineering. Just, uh, we have the first ag 
uh, Rave, um, we have the first precision agriculture academic program in the nation with uh, North Dakota State, Purdue are following us, but uh, we're, uh, we're mo a year from now, we'll be in a brand new facility, which is just incredible. Um, lots of other things, uh, many people remark that they, you know, they can't, uh, they don't recognize the campus that they, that they went to. So it's a very exciting place. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your leadership and, and moving forward and, uh, and providing those opportunities. Uh, let's turn now to uh, a, a topic that, that we've covered uh, here at Rotary and, and uh, has really been on the, the forefront uh, the last 90 days, specifically since the death of George Floyd. Uh, when it comes to, to race, diversity, socioeconomic status, um, help us understand the leadership role that USD, SDSU um, either are playing or need to play for us to move forward so that regardless of a person's um, background, uh, they, they can too pursue the American American dream. Um, President Gestring, why don't we go ahead and start, uh, start with you? Sure. So... Um, you know, since 1955, the University of South Dakota has been working on diversity. Um, in that year, um, the Board of Regents created the Institute of American Indian um, Studies here at the University of South Dakota. In 74, uh, the legislature ratified that um, through the code. And since that time, we've had that institute um, pretty well known for its publishing and documenting of oral histories and supporting Native American students. After the Great Recession, though, it went fairly dormant. And so we are revitalizing that. We've had a couple of large gifts of late that will help us revitalize that. And a big piece of that's going to be not just scholarships for those students, but student supports as well. Mm -hmm. um, we also on campus have the Center for Diversity and Community, which um, has oodles of programming relative to any topic you might think of. And the basic premise behind that center is to bring everyone together to learn as much as they can about diversity and community. And that's critical. I think recently, um, as I think 2020, the Sioux Falls School District is projecting about 40% of their students will be students of color and um, come from more diverse backgrounds. And I think it's incumbent upon our universities to support those students and to provide them opportunities like the Center for Diversity and Community. Uh, you know, another thing is beyond financial aid is mental health as well. Um, and, and different supports that perhaps we're accustomed to. Um, students change and it's not just the diversity, but mm -hmm. students in general. I know that my student, my children are very different than I was and they need different supports. So in terms of giving everyone an opportunity, um, I think we need to look at the services we provide a little bit differently, particularly the mental health and helping students navigate the process and helping them nav navigate a very complex environment and try to make it less complex. Mm -hmm. But yes, we have, an we have an absolute opportunity to serve a more diverse student population. It's going to continue, not just in Sioux Falls, but mm -hmm. in the entire state. And we need to provide that access to everyone. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. President Dunn at SDSU, uh, where do you see your role in uh, in this conversation? Well, I certainly agree with Sheila. It's, ab it's our absolute uh, responsibility. When I gave my inaugural address uh, four years ago, I, I called out the diversity in Sioux Falls and that our challenge as, a, as at South Dakota State was to have a student body uh, that reflected that mm -hmm. in the future, because without that, um, we would leave um, a huge number of, of very important people um, outside of, of society, outside of the economy. So I, I, I brought that message to campus um, as I, I took the office and we've worked really, really hard in that. I also called out at that speech the challenge we have with um, serving the American Indians, uh, as uh, as Sheila talked about, and uh, <clears throat> um, the American Indian students of, of South Dakota. So, um, um, not well, basically, ten percent of the of the of the state's um, population. Uh, um, you know, about um, one and a half percent of our student body 
very low graduation rate at all of the public institutions mm -hmm. of higher ed. It's just, we're, we're not serving that population. It's hard to serve. So we, we developed what we call the Wokini initiate, initiative, which means in Lakota, Wokini means a new beginning. So we're starting over, we can do better. Uh, we've raised, we built a new American Indian Student Center. We would have had a tremendous um, celebration this fall that we're gonna have to wait on. It's a, uh, we, we used almost all donor money to do that. And uh, we also raised nearly $8 million so far towards a $20 million goal of endowed scholarships for American Indian students. Lots of misconceptions about what it's like to be an American Indian in South Dakota. Um, they're great young people. They they uh, they have uh, all the uh, they have all the hopes and dreams as any student mm -hmm. uh, or young person, but they have very few opportunities. So it's hard for them. They don't get a, it's a a myth is that they get a free education. They don't get a free college education. There's a gap there, and our Wakini scholarships bridge that gap. Back to um, a wider diversity challenge in higher education. Um, you know, I, Sheila and I worked very hard on a, on a needs-based scholarship for South Dakota um, for me for three years, so Sheila the last two years. It didn't get funded by the state. So <clears throat> what South Dakota State was, we raised the money privately, and it's called our uh, First Bank and Trust Access College Early uh, Scholarship. And uh, so we're, we're providing basically um, for, for uh, uh, free and reduced lunch students in high school, their junior, senior year, we're paying for their, uh, their portion of a dual credit course. So if, if they'll take dual credit their junior and senior year in high school, they can earn basically a semester of college for free and they will come better prepared. Mm -hmm. And so one of the uh, summer study groups at the legislature a year ago pointed out that uh, free and reduced lunch students uh, had a have very low participation in, in dual credit. So we're trying to change that. We're trying to open the doors to higher education at SDSU for minority students. Yeah, that's great. Challenge for us, but really an opportunity. And it's great to hear that you're uh, uh, pursuing that opportunity. And, and uh, you, you brought up dual credits. I think that's a perfect segue to this uh, next item I want to cover. Uh, and that is the cost of higher education. Uh, it's, it's no secret. Um, there's a lot of reports out there about the cost in, uh, uh, being greater than the, the, uh, the increases in the cost of living or the wages yeah. um, that, that support those. And there's been a lot of conversation about the value pr proposition, return on investment. Um, but when you look at whether you want to call it a student loan crisis, um, what are USD, SDSU doing? And you shared one example, yeah. but what else can be done? Uh, to meet that challenge head on so that the next generation isn't saddled with a uh, exorbitant amount of debt. And I'll let you, uh, why don't you go ahead uh, first, President Dunn. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I, you know, number one, I, th I think it's very important not to paint South Dakota with the broad brush of the United States. Certainly we, we are very concerned. I know I speak for Sheila. We're very concerned about the cost of higher education. The, um, but, but the only increases we've had, and Sheila was the CFO and I was the dean, um, uh, are the, the basically the salary increases um, due to um, uh, salary policy for our, for our, um, our state workers. Um, nearly 30% of the students at SDSU graduate with no federal student loans. So, so there's some misconceptions. The average student loan it, or the average student debt of our graduates has gone down six years in a row. It, last year it was $24,500. That, and that's $1,500 than, lower than the year before. So, you know, I, it isn't that I, I'm not sensitive to the, the cost of higher education, but, but um, so if you average that out, 28% uh, having no debt, and then mm -hmm. the, those that do have debt at 24, a little over 24,000, uh, that's not an unreasonable amount of debt. That's less than the cars that they, a lot of them are driving. And, 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 with, um, and I think the return on investment, if you look at what, what jobs in engineering, pharmacy, mm -hmm. et cetera, pay, um, you know, I don't think that's exorbitant. So, and it's not a bell-shaped curve. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a few students with a lot of debt, and, and that's, that's you know, they, they, that's, that's, a, tra that's a tragedy. Yeah. The worst situation is when they gr don't graduate and they have a lot of debt. Uh, that, is an, that is an American tragedy. 
we're working very hard with, with students. We increased our scholarship awards um, dramatically over the last several years because of uh, very generous donors. But um, it's not something we're insensitive to, but it's not quite the way it is in the rest of the United States. Yeah, well, thank you for localizing a, a national conversation. Um, there's just a lot of information, a lot of static out there. So yep. um, appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, President Gestring, uh, your work, I mean, recent, it's probably not as recent anymore, but the, the USD Community College of Sioux Falls, how does that play a role and, and what else can be done uh, sure. to help support those students that are either working or want to come out of school without um, a heavy debt load? So I think the community college for Sioux Falls can serve a really important role for students that may not be able to physically move to Brookings or to Vermilion. Um, you know, sometimes you can save some dollars for those first couple of years, get those gen ed courses out of the way, work part time, maybe save enough to then transfer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that can play a very important role for those that maybe can't get to campus those first two years open up an opportunity for those that today can't necessarily afford to go to our campuses because room and board separate, uh, two households are more expensive than one, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of our challenges though, is that a community college, a traditional community college model has three funding streams. One is tuition, one is state support, and one is local tax support. Well, the community college for Sioux Falls only has one funding stream. And so, the, the pricing structure in this self-support model, which is set by codified law, we have to be able to recover our costs. That is more expensive than you would find in a traditional community college model. And in fact, not very far across the border, you can find an option that is over $100 a credit hour cheaper. Mm -hmm. We have to solve that challenge in order for that to really take off. There has to be some additional financial support there for those students, be it in the form of scholarships or direct support to the community college. That's our biggest challenge is that pricing challenge there at the community mm -hmm. college for Sioux Falls. Um, but just to piggyback a little bit on what Barry was talking about and how cost conscious and spending conscious we are here in South Dakota. Barry and I both, when we look at what we spend to graduate a student, and that's the most important part, right? That graduate, we are both well below all of our peers. I mean, startling numbers below what our peers spend to graduate a student. So that's really important, I think, for our state to understand that we are incredibly cost conscious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you also, we have to remember that in the last 20, 30, 40 years, we've really shifted from what used to be a view of higher education as both a public good and a private good, private individual good. Right now, the way the funding is set up and they say you spend where your priorities are, um, we are much heavier on the private individual good because that student is paying the vast majority of the cost right now. So when, Barry and our generation attended college, the state tax paid the vast majority, right? That's completely shifted. Um, now the students are paying the vast majority. We need to bring that back to equilibrium. And I understand that there is both a public and a private good involved in higher education. And then I think the last piece I wanna talk about is because you asked if it's worth the investment, the return mm -hmm. on investment. So back in May, Forbes wrote an article talking about unemployment and is college worth it? That was their headline. Mm -hmm. And I found it incredibly interesting that perhaps it's not that first year salary, but how do you survive then based on education level during an economic crisis? Well, bachelor's degree students had an unemployment rate of 8.4%. Those with some college was 15%. And those with only a high school degree was 17% unemployment. I would say that it's very much worth the investment to obtain a higher education. Mm -hmm. Very timely article given the, the situation we're in right now. <laughs> Do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, yeah. Uh, done? <clears throat> thanks, uh, Tony. With the, the work that we've done uh, comparing costs, uh, we're a land-grant university. Uh, the University of Minnesota is the University of 
of uh, Nebraska is, Iowa State is, and North Dakota State is. So we compare our costs. We have fully accredited programs, the same programs, a smaller university, but the same programs basically as those other four schools. We deliver our, our degrees at 67% at of, the, mm. of the price at the, as, as does the University of Minnesota, 70, um, 80% of University of Nebraska, and, 70, and 90% of, uh, of uh, North Dakota State or Iowa State. So we're a great, we're a great buy for the same degree so we're very efficient. Um, we're, we're proud of that. Both institutions have the same story to tell. And uh, we're, we're, we, we think we're doing a really good job with the state with uh, yeah. that responsibility. That's, that's great. And for us prudent South Dakotans, so yeah. it makes, makes us proud too. So thank you for sharing that. It's a, a, something that we read headlines and we see um, there's a, a lot of static out there about that uh, and wanted to get your perspective. Um, now let's let's turn with our the second half of the conversation, uh, what we've all been living the last five months. Um, and, and since middle of March, um, one of the biggest changes for families, for students, is the delivery of education uh, and that experience. Uh, what, if you could step back in time and just talk to us about those first a couple weeks in your experience, the journey that each of you and, and your teams have been on uh, since that time. Uh, and then that'll set us up for for where we go from here. Uh, President Dunn, if you want sure. to go ahead and, and share. Well, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, unbelievable times. Um, you know, we what, we we actually had our first COVID nineteen meeting on campus. Uh, what really it was, it was a SARS um, COVID two meeting. We we didn't not sure it was named yet. Um, the virus was named uh, on, on uh, January twenty second. We started meeting regularly in February. So when we got the march, we were we knew what was going on. We knew we had to do something. And our first step, and we we everything we've done, we've done as a partner with USD and the other four institutions, um, was to ask for uh, to extend spring break to give us two basically two weeks to move um, literally thousands of courses online. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it was a heroic effort by our faculty to do that. Both institutions couldn't be prouder of them. And then we had to uh, we had to empty the dorms and all those things. But moving online, um, very different. There are some courses that don't do well online, and we had to figure out ways uh, with very limited resources how to do that. And uh, and we're very very proud of that. Um, you know, uh, for a long time we had no faculty or staff that had contracted the disease, and so we were able to do that. Those changes and, and keep our faculty, staff, our all of our employees, and and most maybe most importantly, those students safe and uh, very proud of that. So, yeah. yeah. How about President Gestry? I, I just remember back personally. It, it might have been around March 11th. We were on the floor celebrating the USD ladies uh, winning the um, winning the Summit, Summit League, League, and then within 24, 36 hours, the world completely changed. Take us back to that, um, or even before that. It sounds like it was on your radar even before. Um, but what was that experience like, and then how did that prepare you for, for coming into the summer and fall? Sure. So like Barry, we had a task force meeting very early on in Jan end of January through February. By the middle of March, the executive committee was brought into that task force and met daily for several months. Um, I think we're down now to three times a week, which is a welcome relief. Um, but, you know, going back to March 11th, talk about your highs and lows. That was just an incredibly wonderful experience. And my heart bled for those student athletes the next day. Um, and not just the women's basketball team, but all of those student athletes that saw their spring sports removed from them. Um, what, a, what a difficult experience and not just athletics either. We had theater students ready to perform concerts ready to perform and all of those experiences had to be put on hold so very difficult in that regard um, you know and talking too about the the pivot to remote instruction yeah absolutely heroic effort by the faculty couldn't echo that anymore um, but also important to note that that's not how we typically pivot to an online course yeah. there's a difference we've drawn a line of distinction there online are those courses that we intentionally converted. 
we pivoted to remote instruction in March, which is very, very different. Um, but we've also had time since then to prepare, right? So we have what's called a Center for Teaching and Learning. We've made incredible investments in faculty training and time and given them access to resources so that we're prepared. Um, and not necessarily for a full online pivot in the fall, but we will have cases. We know that. We're going to have cases. And so there will be students that will have to isolate, those that are positive, and then their direct contacts will have to quarantine. And so they may need two weeks of instruction. So we provided each faculty member with the opportunity to do lecture capture in the event they have a student impacted by that. So it's not a full pivot, but for each individual student, it might be a 10 day, 14 day experience. And we wanted to make sure that that experience was as academic, as quality of an experience academically as we could possibly make it. Yeah. So that's been a big part of it. Um, yeah, I yeah. just think when you, when you said not all classes are, if you have labs or ag sciences when you're dealing with, yeah. with animals, I, I, I can't imagine. But let's, let's go back to athletics. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's the way that a lot of us associate with our alma mater or with the university. And it's a big part of the experience for the student alumni and, and fans. Um, Missouri Valley Conference recently postponed fall sports and there's talk of potentially uh, looking at that in the spring. Um, decisions will soon need to be made on what this looks like this winter. Um, I guess, take us through a lot of sports fans that are Rotarians, what this journey has looked like when you've known what you've known, what you expect to see moving forward. Um, will we have winter sports, spring sports, and will we get a, will we get to name a, a uh, South Dakota showdown champion this year? Uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, you want to take this one uh, sure. first, President Gestring. I'll try and then uh, <laughs> President Dunn will fill in any blanks. But, you know, so for us, this has been very fluid. The NCAA has met pretty consistently. Our conferences met very consistently. And, you know, as we're moving forward, the testing was a challenge for us in terms of that requirement initially. Uh, will there be spring sports? I don't know. I think back to in March when we did pivot, right? And we went to remote instruction. And then someone asked me, well, you went remote in March and there were fewer cases, how can you open in the fall? Well, we've learned a lot mm -hmm. in five months, right? So who knows what we might learn between now and when winter sports might start. But we are having those conversations now, now that the fall sports have been decided, our conferences will have those discussions. And with everything, it's very fluid. What we know today may change in a week. Yeah, are you seeing students look at other options for schools that might be playing sports. I'm just, just you're hearing about some of that. I think some of that has subsided as other conferences have also kind of closed the door on the season, but I'm just thinking if I'm an athlete and I sh showed up early for school and then all of a sudden things were, were shut down. Talk to us about that, that experience for that student athlete that has really got all the time in the day, but really no, no practice to go to. Sure. So, it's not that they don't necessarily have practice, they still have workouts. It's less time than you might expect in the fall. Um, I've not heard a lot about that, um, maybe initially, but as you said, as everyone made that shift, then that changed a lot um, mm -hmm. for those students. <clears throat> you know, when we talk to students, and I'm not sure every conference did this, but Barry and I did this, and I know the two of us did it personally, um, socially distanced with Ooh. masks, um, which e with each of the fall teams. And, and you brought up football. That one in particular, those students wanted the opportunity at a championship if there will be one. And we knew at that time as a Missouri Valley Conference that enough conferences had punted to spring that there would not be a fall championship. So we brought that student voice to the table as well. If mm -hmm. there's a chance for a spring championship, then that's when our students want to play. Yeah, well said, President Dunn. Yeah, it's really it's really tough, and uh, it's and as Sheila said, it's dynamic. Um, just last week, the NCAA 
uh, started changing some things. I sit on a NCAA presidential forum. There's 32 presidents on that advisory group, and we're not, we don't make the decisions, but but we do have our voice heard. And so I represent the Summit League. And um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, some some requirements. I you heard a lot about the testing requirement. The other requirement that was basically impossible for anyone to to comply with was insurance, mm -hmm. that, that we would indemnify the, all of our student athletes basically forever. It says a couple of years, but it's gonna be forever. And that's, that is really, um, that is changing. So okay. if, if, they, if the NCAA changes some things, I think we have a, we have a chance to participate. Uh, but, but honestly, um, cases in South Dakota are going up, cases around the United States um, the hot spots are down south have leveled off a little bit, but this is a really serious virus. So how do you put a group of young people on a bus to one of the hot spots? Um, mm -hmm. So when we, the weekend we made those decisions, when Sheila and I were involved in that, um, the S CDC called out uh, Omaha, Denver, and and uh, and um, uh, Kansas City as as potential hot spots. Those three cities are we, where we would be sending students. Is that a good idea on, on be, in the best interest of the student? We have to keep that in mind. This mm -hmm. is not forever. Um, eligibility uh, is going to be given to extended eligibility is going to be given to all student athletes. Uh, it, it really does affect seniors the most. That's mm -hmm. that is the tragic part of this. Uh, some really uh, great student athletes will lose the opportunity and might choose to move on in life. But, um, but, but again, let's keep this in perspective. Ath athletics is really important. You know, we're both big sports fans, but um, um, health and safety of staff mm -hmm. and students is number one. And, and we can't assure that right now. That mm -hmm. was the point of, of NCAA was, can you assure that your student athletes, athletes will be safe? Right now, that's pretty hard to do. Yeah. A lot of unknowns, and, and like you said, health and safety is of most importance. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. It's just uh, as, as sports fans, um, and I, I realize they're there to get an education, but for for us, oh. um, it's, <coughs> it's a big part of the experience, and, and we're all cheering for uh, uh, for the students to get <laughs> yes. the students to get back as soon as they possibly can. Yeah. Uh, let's pivot now to, uh, and it's related to sports, but it's related to the. Uh, what our entire country is going through. You talk about things being fluid. Um, higher education, it's no secret, has been under financial pressure for um, for years. But, but talk about the economics of navigating your institutions through this environment. Um, I mean, it's not a secret. You were going to go to Nebraska. You're going to go to Iowa State. And those are, are, are big contributions to your sports budgets. But there's room and board of students that, that don't show up. So just talk to us about, um, from your purview, what, uh, what, what, what you see. Me first? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, Sheila's, our, Sheila's our, our finance expert, but it, it's uh, financially, uh, SDSU is in very strong position as is as USD. So I, I think we would like, I think collectively, <laughs> Sheila, we, we'd like to relieve a little pressure um, anxiety that our fans and supporters might have. We ended both ended the year in stronger positions than we were a year ago, which is uh, so. Congratulations to Sheila. So, um, so from that perspective, I think we're ready to face a challenge. Um, you know, that, that you know, if we have to go home again, um, we're we're ready financially to to meet that head on. The 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 uh, impact on. Athletics, in particular, is really tough because uh, we're we've, we're keeping those students on scholarship, but we've also dramatically cut expenses because we're not traveling, and uh, traveling for those uh, football team is extremely expensive. So we're trying to figure this out as we go. We have great supporters, uh, we have great benefactors for both of our programs, and hopefully we can get through this. Uh, and and uh, certainly we we all hope that next year will be whatever normal is, but. Uh, Back to, back to full schedules once we have a vaccine and and uh, some treatments and things like that. But I, I feel pretty confident about our ability to financially handle the, the future. Um, if we go home again, we're going to have to make we're going to have to make refunds, all those things. Um, we got great help from the federal government. We got great help from from uh, Governor Nome. Both of us did, mm -hmm. and uh, so, so probably some of that would come again. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly it is uh, uncertain times. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you brought it up. You had to refund students that left in March. And then I just presume that maybe not as many are on campus now, but I, I could be off on that. You want to talk about your your numbers, uh, uh, too, for, for students and their comfort level, the families that, to have them attend in person, um, what that what that looks like yeah. for USD? Sure. So uh, I would say that our num we can't officially talk about enrollment <laughs> for about three more weeks, I think. Oh. In general, general sense, right now the way things look, our graduate enrollments are actually up, um, which doesn't surprise me in an economic downturn. Um, I think that's wise that if you aren't able to get that first professional position, graduate school is a really great option. Um, I would say, by and large, undergraduates going to be fairly flat, um, but that's that would be expected without a pandemic. Because, mm -hmm. as you know, the high school graduate numbers are on decline for a little while here. Eventually, I think in about five years, we start to turn back up. But right now, they're in decline. So that would be expected e even without a pandemic. So, you know, we really haven't seen significant number of people choose to stay home a few anecdotally mm -hmm. here and there one thing that was very interesting to me back in may before we had announced that we were going to go face to face our retention number of last year's freshmen was six percent lower than the year before about a month after we announced we were going face to face our retention number was the highest it's ever been on record and still is today um, right now, our retention of last year's cohort is the highest on record at the University of South Dakota. So hopefully that's an indication that the students feel very confident about the plans that our six regional institutions have put in place in order to keep them safe, in order to provide as much face-to-face -face programming as we can. Mm -hmm. um, also an interesting thing that I think has helped us in that regard is USD only had to convert 6% of its traditional face-to-face -face classes to online, actually less than 6%, I'm rounding up. I get to do that now that I'm a recovering CFO. <laughs> um, but many classes are hybrid, which hybrid is confusing to some people if they don't know what it is, but I actually believe that might be the future for many people because it allows so much flexibility. What hybrid is, practically speaking at USD, is one face-to-face -face experience per week per class. Um, and that's to make sure that we have the proper physical distancing um, and the safety protocols in place. But I think both faculty and students are gonna find that they really like the flexibility that a hybrid course provides. And we still only had to convert less than 30% there. Um, so by and large, the message is about 94% of the classes that were traditionally face-to-face -face at USD still have face-to-face -face components to them. That's great. So in some ways as others across the country have maybe gone completely online have you have you seen that as an opportunity for yes. our for our state and then i'm also curious on the international side what your what your experience has been with international students usd has never i don't think reached its full potential on international students so it didn't hit us as hard as perhaps some that had had evolved or a more mature international program but we were on track to see a very large increase in international students, and obviously that's not going to materialize now with so many consulates shut down. Um, I think SDSU has always been um, much heavier on the international student side, so Barry's probably got a little bit more perspective there. Yeah, our enrollment for fall, can't, can't talk about it in specifics, but retention is extremely high, which means there's confidence in us, as Sheila said, highest we've ever had. Uh, we have more domestic freshmen on campus than we did a year ago, uh, where where we will have a challenge as international. Mm -hmm. So we had, we were approaching a thousand international students um, several years ago. Um, but we will, um, um, but we will see another drop this year in international. We'll probably be down around you know, five to six hundred. So it's it's hurt our international a lot because they can't get visas and they can't they can't travel so mm -hmm. it's tough if you're an international student yeah we've just heard anecdotally that schools that are in person have seen some students make changes right before the school year so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and we'll be looking forward to, yeah. to hearing your enrollment numbers here in a few uh 
a few short weeks. Let's continue on the, the school year. We've got anxious parents that are Rotarians and grandparents uh, at Notre Dame, University of North Carolina, just a few days into their, their school year. Um, they moved to, uh, to, to fully online. Um, I believe you started just this past Wednesday. So you have three days under your belt. Uh, share your experience thus far and your level of optimism moving forward. Uh, President Dunn. Well, I think we're both optimistic, but we're also very cautious. Um, we, uh, we, our move online those first three days, we, we, uh, we had a, a very, um, we had very few bumps. We, we, it went pretty well, had a few complaints and few hiccups on some of the technology that President Gestring talked about. But, um, you know, we're really pleased from functionally how we did it. Dorm life is, is, is relatively normal. Um, e um, eating is not. There's a lot of grab and go, and I don't think that's real popular. Um, but there's not a lot of choice uh, if you're really going to do this well. So there are some challenges. Um, but I, I, was, um, I was standing in line at our Chick-fil-A the other on Friday, and talking to a, a student, and uh, she's from St. Peter, Minnesota. She's a freshman. Um, she, she, you know, just as excited as she could be, just bubbling with uh, excitement to be on campus and to be at a university. I, I, you know, we also heard some some challenge, some kids that weren't so excited about some things, but but generally um, very excited. Um, our big challenge won't be us managing the virus on campus. I really believe it'll be off-campus behavior of students. Mm -hmm. And that's what took you and uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill down. It's what took Notre Dame down, Michigan State down, Drake, Iowa State, all of them. That's what's their biggest challenge. It'll be our biggest challenge is behavior off-campus. Mm -hmm. um, the parties, bars, that's where the, you know, a major um, transmission of, of COVID is, is in large groups without social distance, distancing, without masks, and bars in particular are bad. So our, our students' own behavior will dictate whether we can stay on campus. Yeah, what can you do? Um, I mean, that's a big part of the, yeah. the college experience is the, the social aspects. Um, what have you done or can you do as, as part of that to reinforce that? Yeah. Um, I sent out a video message. We've worked with we've worked with um, a lot of young people on becoming um, role models. Uh, our student association, our student athletes, really becoming role models. But but um, so we've tried everything we can think of, from kind of grumpy old uh, speech from an old man like me, <laughs> to uh, uh, to uh, communication every which way we can. I, I think it was good for us that those schools shut down because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just a grumpy old man. It was, um, there's real evidence that if you mess this up, you're going to be in your mom and dad's basement for the next six months. And that's not where you want to be. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, they're, they're young adults and they, and they, they want their responsibility if you ask them. And so now this is, this is their time to, to show it. I, I sincerely as much work as we've done in the classroom and in our buildings and in dorm life, I sincerely believe our biggest challenge is off-campus behavior. Yeah, thank you, uh, well said. Um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the, the delivery methods. There's, you hear about synchronous versus asynchronous, yeah. hybrid versus online versus uh, remote. So talk a little bit about that. And then also, uh, President Gestring, interested in, in your thoughts, um, all organizations, institutions have various levels. What would it take uh, for you to go completely online? I get asked that question all the time and there's not an easy answer. That is a really complicated question, actually. It's hard to respond to. And I know that people get frustrated with me and others when I don't give them a hard quantitative number of what that might be. What we will look at is the epidemiology. Mm -hmm. We will look at our capacity to isolate those that are positive and quarantine those that are direct exposures. We will look at, um, we will also be in consultation with the Board of Regents. This is not a decision that Barry and I would make independently. Um, we would be in consultation with the Board of Regents in the Department of Health and the local city and county health um, officials as well. So it's a very complex response to that question. Um, just for context, so that I do have some quantitative numbers. We currently have 
over 100 rooms set aside for isolation and for quarantine. And we also have MOUs with local hotels should we need additional capacity. If we were to get to a point that those spaces were overrun and the hospital system in South Dakota, which for both of us would include the Sioux Falls system, if they were to become overrun, those are the sorts of epidemiological things that we need to be thinking about in that decision. Um, but we believe we've built a really solid plan and that we have the capacity in place. Um, we have the services available. Um, I know that there was an article about a school to our um, east not that long ago talking about a pretty awful experience by one of their students that had to go into isolation. And we don't have that. Um, we actually have had cases. We knew that was going to happen. We planned for it all summer. And what we do is we provide them with three meals plus snacks. And in certain circumstances, you know, if a student reaches out and we say, what can we do to make this better? We had our Dean of Students deliver crafts over to one room, for example, so that that student could stay busier because that was before classes had actually started. So there isn't an easy hard line X number of cases for when that decision is made, but more so looking at our capacity to care for those students. Yeah, well, we're all praying that, uh, <laughs> that we can navigate this uh, yes. together and we'll be watching. Uh, let's go back to the, the different formats. For those that, uh, that don't have students there, talk to us about the different options, um, whether you're a freshman or senior, for, for uh, taking in the, the various classes. Sure. So I alluded to it a little bit earlier when I was talking about the number of courses that were converted from a traditional face-to-face -face setting. USD, as well as SDSU for decades, has actually had very robust online offerings. For, for those students that may be at risk or feel more safe and would like that option, our schools, as well as the others in the regional system in the state of South Dakota, had made those investments probably about two decades ago. And those are fairly robust systems already in place and are an option. Um, we also, we've had hybrid for a while, and I talked about that, mm -hmm. practically speaking, that means one face-to-face -face, um, setting per week. Um, but we haven't had a lot of takers over the years in terms of trying to convert a course. Well, now this has been a really good time to see how that's going to work and see how faculty and students like that in other parts of the country, that hybrid model is very popular. So that is one of the other modalities. And then of course, there's the traditional face-to-face -face modality, um, which we've had for since 1852 mm -hmm. or 62, excuse me, I just added 10 years to our length. Um, <clears throat> so those are the three primaries that I would say are available on campus. Um, we did a lot of Zoom in the mm -hmm. spring. That is not what we're doing in these situations. It's very different. Yeah, a lot more time to prepare and yes. uh, ready going in. Um, President Gestring, you've been in your role two years. Uh, President Dunn, you've been in your role four years. Uh, if you can pick out one or two of the top accomplishments that gives you pride, um, you share that with our Rotarians. Uh, we've, lot, we've talked about a lot of things that uh, likely proud of, but uh, what, what uh, stands above the rest? President Dunn? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's Wokini. It's, it's uh, that building that relationship with the uh, American Indian communities here in Sioux Falls uh, and all across the state on the nine reservations. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's some misconceptions, again, I'll, I'll pick up on that about uh, reservation life and the impact of those, that, those people to our state. Um, personally, my, uh, my family's uh, uh, from Rosebud and, and my mom's family. Um, my mom was a member of the tribe and, and so I, it's very important to me personally. But, but um, three quarters of the population in the women's prison in in, in, in um, Pierre, South Dakota are American Indians and they only represent 10% of our population. About 35% of the male population here in Sioux Falls of the state penitentiary are American Indians. This is, this is not just an Indian problem or a federal problem. This is negatively impacting our entire state. If you do the math on, on what it costs just for the room and board of that many people, it's 30 plus million dollars a year this is South Dakota's long-standing, you know, um, 
problem that needs to get solved. And I believe what, what I can do is education. So I believe it, that it is what lifts people up and I'm, we're, we're doing everything we can to open the doors to the benefits of, of education to all the people of South Dakota. And I, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I don't, I'm also humbled by uh, the opportunity and also by how tough that problem is. It isn't that people haven't tried. And I, I, I don't work magic, but we're gonna work very hard to uh, change those, those, uh, the, the, the lives of young people in South Dakota. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And uh, President Gestring? Well, I'm just going to preface everything that gets accomplished at USD takes a big team, and there's not one single thing that I ever did individually in the last two years. Um, grateful to that team for everything they've done. If I had to focus on one concept, maybe not one task, but one concept, it would be the student affordability initiatives. So um, just a couple quick examples of that. We started the Open Educational Resources Fellowship with some faculty. And what that is, is that's where um, faculty will look and see if there are free, maybe online or peer reviewed or very, very low cost materials that they can use to teach their course. Well, that takes time. So we provided a stipend to those faculty to do that research. And we were able to convert enough courses that will save the students in one semester in spring semester last year saved the students over $150,000. That's one semester and that's the pilot version of the program. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing we did to help with the cost of books because we hear all the time about how expensive books are. We moved to sort of a virtual um, bookstore and we still have a retail presence where we have the, the gear and all of the promotional items available that everyone loves, especially for Christmas presents. Um, but now the physical books are no longer on campus and that markup is gone. And over the course of an academic year, our students collectively saved nearly a million dollars. That's huge for those students. So I would say those two combined with a number of other issues, the proudest moment or proudest accomplishment so far has been our focus, our laser focus on that affordability initiative. Yeah, so important. And, yeah. and you two aren't done with those accomplishments. Uh, as, as we uh, come to a close here, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, for those out there that, that uh, might have uh, children, grandchildren in high school or grade school, um, share with us what you see when you look out over the horizon, your vision uh, for the future of uh, both SDSU and USD. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, you go first. Sure. Session, so I think the University of South Dakota has only really just begun to tap its full potential. Um, like I mentioned, we have a really strong team there and that's faculty, staff, everyone um, top to bottom. I would say that those faculty and staff are committed to student success um, regardless of what that might be in some minds. It's probably different for every individual student, but they are committed to the success of each and every individual student. And we're large enough that we provide a breadth of opportunities, but small enough that our faculty can create lifelong mentorship, back mm -hmm. to the Rotarian mentorship and the importance there, that lifelong mentorship with those students. Um, there are faculty that talk about students that have graduated decades ago, and they still have those relationships. Um, you know, going forward, you can continue to count on high quality law school, as I forgot to mention, because we were talking capital facilities, the $12.5 million gift for the Knutson School of Law and the scholarships that that will provide in perpetuity. High quality school of medicine, consistently achieving national awards. Every year, it's a different one. Um, high quality professional schools, education, business, college of fine arts, uh, and just an absolute critical liberal arts foundation that will help them lead, learn, and innovate into the future and for the rest of their careers. Yeah, well said. President Dunn? Yeah, I think it's, it's such an exciting future for these young people and, and uh, an SDSU needs to be nimble and, and change and, and uh, and change what we offer and how we offer it. And um, so uh, data science and, and analytics and 
agriculture, all of that merging together to to create a, a very exciting future where farmers, you know, uh, plan on multiple layers of, of geographic information systems. Um, engineers um, are are using tools that really none of us can really imagine. I, I think that us for us to stay nimble and and exciting for for people. Also exploring opportunities. We. And we are recruiting our first class of, of students into our new um, uh, rural school for veterinary medicine that we teamed up with the University of Minnesota with. So what you know what what's that next opportunity to make uh, help SDSU serve the state is what we're looking for. And so it's precision agriculture, it's veterinary medicine, it's computer, it's uh, data analytics. It's just a, a very exciting time. So yeah, very great. Well, thank you both as you uh, both uh, work to lead your respective organizations and, and uh, educate the next generation of South Dakotans that will uh, uh, take a lot of important roles in our various communities and, and move this state forward. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for, for being here. Um, we wish you nothing but the best as you work to navigate this, this year and we'll be uh, cheering you on throughout that. Uh, for Rotarians and, and guests, thank you for uh, joining another edition of our virtual downtown Rotary. We would ask that you would join us again next week as we host uh, Governor Christy Nome uh, for a sit down conversation uh, moderated by Rotarian Jack Marsh. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks.